Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to uh, this first of our colloquia series. I want to welcome you to the Jack Joseph and Morton Mandel School of Applied Social Sciences in our first of our Centennial Research and Training Colloquia Series. I'm Elizabeth Tracy. I'm a faculty member, and I'm the Associate Dean for Research and Training here. We are a very diverse group gathered here this afternoon. We have students, we have alumni, we have faculty, we have field instructors, community practitioners and administrators, and even a few potential students. So we represent the social work profession and the Mandel School very well, I feel. A warm welcome also to our viewers connecting remotely. There are a number of people who are listening in through our live media stream. This session is being live streamed and it will later be posted on the website. Just a few logistics before we do the introductions. Restrooms are to your right in the lobby. If you're a student, please make sure you sign the sheet for professional development hours. I see most of you have done that. If you've signed up for Social Work CEUs, Ina Brand will have them I have the certificates for you in the lobby at the end of today's session. I can't start without a few well-deserved thank yous. Helen Menke from the doctoral program, Ina Brand, Maria Sharon, Tracy Braddon, Communications and Marketing, and Nora Hennessy, Associate Dean for Institutional Advancement. All these people, and probably more that I haven't named, have helped put this together. This colloquial series is co-sponsored by the Office of Research Administration and the doctoral program at the Mandel School. And we're pleased and proud to note that all speakers in this series are graduates of the Mandel School. Today we're happy to have with us Mark Chapin, who earned his PhD from the Mandel School in 1995, and Lisa Pape is a 1990 MSSA graduate. Each speaker will present for about 50 minutes. There will be time at the end of each speaker's talk for some questions. I will be the timekeeper today. You all know these. And at 5 p.m., you will be invited to the lounge area for a reception and an informal time to interact with the speakers. At your seat, you have more detailed biographical statements for each of our distinguished speakers. You also have the complete list of the colloquia for this academic year. And there is an evaluation form and a place for you to deposit them at the end of the session. And in the interest of preserving time for our speakers to talk, I'm going to give some brief introductions. But you can follow along on the bios and see the many experiences and expertise that are brought to us today. Our first speaker is Dr. Mark Chapin. He's currently team leader, the Annapolis Vet Center, US Department of Veteran Affairs, where he specializes in addictions, post-traumatic stress disorder, marital family therapy, mind-body medicine, and community outreach. His talk today is Research on Military Families and Deployment, Hero Stories and Horror Stories. And I'll introduce Lisa now, and then I'll say hello when you get up again. Our second speaker, Ms. Lisa Pape, is Executive Director, Homeless Programs Office for the Veterans Health Administration within the Department of Veterans Affairs, where she designs programs to most effectively meet the needs of our nation's veterans who are homeless or who are at risk of becoming homeless. Her talk today is Policy Perspectives on Serving Homeless Veterans. And with that, please join me now in welcoming our first speaker, Dr. Mark Chapin. Thank you for the warm welcome. Can you all hear me? Can you hear me OK? I've been told that I have a soft voice, so I'm going to stick pretty close to the podium today. Um, Actually, I changed the topic a little bit instead of just the hero stories and horror stories. I'm actually going to talk about an arc from theory to practice to evaluation. Um, after I retired from the Army, I worked at Walter Reed Army Medical Center uh, in, the, in their Department of Social Work for a couple of years. A big part of my practice there was working with families of severely injured soldiers. I wanted to provide services to these families that would be grounded in family systems theory and provided in a way that we'd be able to measure whether our er efforts were helpful or not. I was able to draw from Hamilton McCubbin's work on Vietnam era POW families, David Riggs' extensive study of Vietnam veterans and their spouses, their, and their individual and marital adjustment 25 years after Vietnam concluded, um, and the work of the Center for Deployments Psychology at the Uniformed Services University of the Health Sciences. 
In the short time I have to spend with you this afternoon, we won't have time to go into great deal about any of those three components, but I'd like to instead focus on sort of an overview or, or this arc of practice that is grounded in research, how that helps us design interventions, and then how we evaluate them. So, um, I'll just, so I propose to do a few things here. First, I'll describe a conceptual framework that was very useful to us in developing services to families of severely injured soldiers. Second, I'll talk about a caregiving skills workshop that we developed for spouses of the severely injured. And then third, I'll share the results of the program evaluation we did after the initial pilot group. In addition, I hope to put a human face on some of these concepts by telling some of the stories of the brave warriors and just as brave families uh, who've been going through this war and its aftermath for the last 14 years. So remember back to your master's program, uh, and you'll recall Eric's, Eric, Eric Erickson's stages of development. You know, the, the, his view of developmental stages which are characterized by psychosocial crises and developmental tasks that have to be negotiated to continue emotional and psychological growth. There are expected crises, such as when a couple becomes a family by welcoming their firstborn child. Also, most parents of teens would agree that adolescence is a developmental crisis for the family as well. Um, and so, so these are sort of the expected things that typically happen over a family lifestyle. However, Eric Erickson did not serve in the military. <laughs> For families in the military, deployment is a developmental normative crisis uh, for them. It's part of a soldier's job, and during times of war, it happens, A, to almost everyone, and B, it happens uh, usually more than once. Okay. Um, let me start by saying that most families get through this crisis just fine. Uh, if we think of a healthy family as one that has a strong sense of cohesion and meaning, good coping and problem solving skills, resources both material and emotional, effective communication, and an extended support system in their larger family, community, and church, then deployment presents stresses that challenge these family components, but the outcome can be growth and strength. So I'm an example of that process. Um, as my wife deployed to Iraq in 2005 with only about 30 days notice uh, to fill in for someone who became medically disqualified at the last minute. It was tough. We weren't even married yet at the time. We were just dating. Um, but adding more stress to the process, she was medevaced home for emergency surgery about halfway through her deployment. But we got through it. We, actually ended, we ended up actually getting married. <laughs> so, and that deployment experience taught us incredible lessons early in our relationship about patience, communication, support, and commitment to the relationship. Now the soldier as an adult leader of his or her family will set the tone of the deployment, especially as a liaison and broker to military resources available to all military families and special resources available to families of deployed soldiers. The deployment experience will likely set the tone and parallel the family's experience. Now I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, Hamilton McCubbin. Um, I got to spend some time with him because I, in the 90s I did a research project uh, for the Walter Reed Army Institute of Research on uh, the families of the Vietnam POWs. And he was actually an active duty social work officer in the Army uh, during the Vietnam War. And he had worked for five years with the families of those while they were still in captivity and then during their reunion and reintegration phase. And he's researched and written extensively about this most extreme form of stressful deployment when someone is captured or missing in action. And one of his scholarly gifts to our profession has been the development of a resilience perspective on military families. Uh, so he's researched and tested a resiliency model and assessment instruments which have been able to validate this model. I was able to use these assessment instruments called the Family Index of Regenerativity and Adaptation, dash M for military, uh, to document the changes um, in this caregiver skills workshop that we designed for spouses of injured soldiers at Walter Reed. Now, McCubbin's work itself is standing on the shoulders of giants, and it's based on Reuben Hill's work with families of MIA 
uh, families of MIA soldiers in World War II. Reuben Hill was a sociologist who initially developed a simple form of this model looking at stresses, adaptations, supports, and things like that. And McCubbin uh, was able to take the largely theoretical model from Reuben Hill um, and, and put it into a quantitative framework where you could actually assess, measure, and test these relationships. So I'm going to propose this model uh, to help us look at families' experiences of military deployment from this particular resilience perspective. And I brought a prop with me. <laughs> this is the Family Resilience Bible. <laughs> so, um, this is Reuben Hill's collected assessment instruments and validation information on uh, family assessment, resiliency, coping, and adaptation. So. Um, although you wouldn't guess it from his name, Hamilton McCubbin is a native Hawaiian, and after his military service, um, he was on faculty at the College of Human Ecology at the University of Wisconsin-Madison for a while, uh, and then was at the University of Hawaii. And so not all this is about military families, but he's normed these uh, instruments, uh, these assessment instruments uh, for Hawaiian families, for African American families, for deployed families, for um, families in poverty. And so all these little tabs here are the ones about military families that I used. So, so this, is, this is where we got it. And there's the model. And here's where I get to play with a laser pointer. So, since most of you are mental health professionals, I'm not going to spend a lot of time explaining each component of the model. Many of them are pretty self-explanatory. Like, if you're in graduate school, you know what a stressor event is, right? So, um, a pileup of demands is when a number of stressor events happen uh, within a short period of time. Um, there are a lot of arrows and multiple connections here, indicating a lot of connectivity among these concepts, indicating that there are statistically measurable and sometimes significant correlations. When this model is tested on a specific population, analysis techniques, multivariate analysis techniques such as path analysis and structural equation modeling can help to create what they call a trimmed model, which shows the strongest pathway of relationships through these different components. So, and this model has been tested on a variety of families, from military families in Europe during the height of the Cold War to Native Hawaiian families and African American family, military families at bases in the US. The only thing that may bear a little explanation is this family type. And this is a kind of a secondary thing that Hamilton McCubbin dis discovered as that families typically fell along some continuum of a typology and that he could that where he could describe many of the families he studied. These are like default settings for how families function. And the, the, what he identified through his research are what he called regenerative families, versatile families, rhythmic families, and traditionalist families. And so these are families that have a kind of a specific way of coping with changes, stresses, uh, decisions, things like that. Each of these family types represents a continuum of defining characteristics and they can adapt or change. Oops. Sorry, they can adapt or change over a family cycle, or, uh, over a family's life cycle and couplehood to the, from, the, from early in the marriage and couplehood to uh, dealing with the empty nest and retirement. Also on the far end of that, family ad adaptation is, can represent a number of outcomes and a number of ways to measure that from uh, families that stay together, families that fracture, or families that muddle on through, families that really succeed, uh, or families that uh, become dysfunctional. Now, one of the things that, that we th when we think about deployment, it's not just the actual time away, and that uh, this is the cycle of deployment that the military uses to explain how both individual individuals and entire units are rotated from their training base here in the United States to a combat theater of operations, and then brought home for reconstitution, replacements, and retraining. Uh, I have to give credit to Dr. David Riggs from the uh, from the Uniformed Services University of the Health Sciences. Um, uh, He's in, for, at the Center for Deployment Psychology, and he's done a lot of work with military families early, early in his career at the VA, um, and then later working uh, at the Center for Deployment Psychology. He didn't make up the cycle, but he gave me permission to use the slide. 
You, one of the signature features of the, of the current global war on terror and the wars in Afghanistan and in Iraq are multiple deployments. Most of our career active duty social workers have deployed at least twice now. So they've been, t they've been through all this with their families, as well as working with soldiers and their families at each stage of deployment. As we have cycled through this process with hundreds of thousands of soldiers and their families, we found some common developmental tasks, challenges, and we've been able to design some interventions to help people through each phase of the cycle. So we're gonna take, uh, take a look at each phase individually and then sort of apply each phase to this resiliency model. So pre-deployment stage starts when a soldier's unit is notified that they're deploying. Some larger units, like division size units of 18 to 20,000 soldiers, will have responsibility for a geographic area of Iraq or Afghanistan, and then rotate each of their striker brigades, which are smaller units, uh, through deployment on an annual basis, uh, which for most of the time for the Army is a year, but for a while there was that surge and, there were, and there were, some people were held not on a voluntary basis for 15 months. Um, while it sounds like it means a soldier would have one year deployed and then two years back in the U.S., the reality is that 12 or 15 months is only the deployment phase uh, when they're actually gone. Pre-deployment can take six months to a year, um, and just as post-deployment itself can take several months in terms of the assessments and cleaning equipment and bringing things back to readiness. So the full cycle for one of the current 15-month deployments that are now just ending is actually closer to two years. Soldiers also rotate from post to post for, at individual uh, forts, posts, camps, and stations um, as they get promoted and develop new leadership skills and responsibilities. So sometimes a soldier will leave a unit that's recently back from deployment, move across the country to another unit that is just getting ready to deploy. So they have a very limited amount of time back in the States. So back-to-back so -back deployments like this are especially stressful, especially if you're throwing in a family move across the country at the same time. So here's, here's what we can look at for um, some of the factors that, that impact this family resilience model in the pre-deployment phase. So it mostly impacts the left side in terms of stressors, in terms of that, that involve preparation. Um, Notification itself can be a stressful event, especially if it comes as a surprise or arrives at a time when there are other concerns that are impacting the family. So most obvious among this young family population is pregnancy. So other things may be a family illness in a child, a spouse or parent, interruption of an academic program, missing key milestones such as high school graduation, or dealing with ongoing marital problems, or an impending marriage separation or divorce. So, so all these are different kinds of things that are stressor events. For example, in the summer of 1991, um, we got three pieces of good news all in one week. First, I found out that there was a really nice house open on base, which we'd been waiting for for over a year. So we're gonna move from our off post rental home on, into, into quarters on post. Second, we found out we were expecting our, our next baby, due date next February. Then third, that's when I got selected for the Army's long-term education program and elected to come here to Case Western. So we were gonna move in another year. Um, so in 1990, we moved from Germany to San Antonio. In 1991, we moved from the rental house into government quarters. And then in 1992, we moved from San Antonio to Cleveland. So all these things were positive, sought after changes that we were things that had set a goal to do and, and wanted to do. But coming in such rapid succession were pretty stressful. So family preparation for deployment uh, often um, involves decisions about whether to stay in the military community or move back home during the deployment time. Also, this is a time when families, part of the preparation here um, is um, updating their legal papers such as wills, insurance forms, deeds, and powers of attorney, things like that. Arrangements need to be made for paying bills, childcare, home maintenance, and any other tasks that the deploying spouse has responsibility for in the marriage. So another important preparation is setting up communication between the soldier and family. Email accounts for the kids, webcams, MP3 players, and recorded messages, things like that. So, so, so there are quite a few things that are happening here. So um, the second stage is the deployment phase. 
And there are three big hallmark tasks of the actual deployment phase. And they consist of first managing the chaos and turmoil of the actual departure um, and, and the acute readjustment to the soldier's absence. Second, the sustainment through the long months of absence, just getting by without an important member of the family. And three, third thing is dealing with the fears and actual experiences of the cold soldier's combat exposure, risks, near misses, and actual injuries. <clears throat> so there are stresses that happen at, at this stage as well. Um, some of the things that we know here are some home front worries. Um, one of the things that we know are that about 30% of deployed families experience financial problems. I mean, serious financial problems like credit cards maxed, maxed out, possible for home foreclosure, or things like that. Um, there are serious, um, serious decisions for the family that stays, stays back home. Uh, are they going to change their job? Are they going to have to stop working? Uh, or, or should they go closer to home to be closer to extended family? Things like that. Um, the other thing to manage that can be a stressor or the, uh, that falls under situational appraisals is, is kids' reactions to war events because a lot of times we found that family members you know, keep seeing on, on all the time in the background and the kids are floating in and out and at what age do they really have a sense of what's going on? I mean, five-year-olds, when they watch a TV and they see bombs going off and things like that, they think it's happening right outside or down around the corner, things like that. Um, uh, families uh, have evolved a lot of uh, coping skills and uh, communication techniques. Um, you know, this is the first war that we've been involved in where, uh, where we've had Skype <laughs> and instant messenger and things like that. Um, and somehow that's, that's a, a double-sided coin because it's really nice to be able to have a conversation with your kids at night. Um, and, uh, and I've seen photos of, of soldiers seeing their babies being born in the first view of their newborn baby, which makes everyone go, oh, isn't that so sweet? Uh, but on the other hand, if you've established regular communication like that, um, then what happens on the first night when you know, the soldier's supposed to call in but doesn't? and you haven't heard anything. <coughs> the other thing is, is um, in the Arab-Israeli Arab War in 1967, um, Jahava Solomon uh, is a psychiatrist who studied uh, the mental health reactions of, of Israeli soldiers in combat. And she found that the soldiers who were most likely to experience combat stress reactions, in other words, to freeze up in combat, to become combat ineffective, um, were those who were also dealing with home front issues, such as marital problems or family illness, things like that. So the downside of Skyping with your family is that, you know, um, your, you know, your spouse and your teenage child are having an argument in, on the video screen right in front of you, and you're like 10,000 miles away feeling pretty helpless, those kinds of things. Um, and so it's harder to focus on just on the job of being a soldier at that point when you're also trying to manage the things that are happening 10,000 miles away with your family. So. so, And then we have the pileup of demands with single parenting, loneliness, uh, for social support, one of the things in the military communities are called FRGs, or Family Resource Groups. These are typically the family members and spouses of those deployed, and they sort of follow the chain of command, where like the, the unit commander's spouse is supposed to be sort of like the chairperson, and then the subunit group uh, spouses are, are helpers, and, and so they can't maintain sort of a chain of concern, as they call it, uh, and a chain of communication so that news about what's happening with the folks, the unit in the field gets disseminated. If people are having problems or some, you know, if one of the unit members is having a baby, then they get together and help out and provide casseroles for a week and things like that. Um, and so uh, those are an important uh, area of social support uh, in the, uh, uh, during the deployment within the military community. So some of the things we know about deployment stressors um, is that um, back in 2004, when this uh, data was collected, there were still some Army families that hadn't experienced deployment because it was very early in, in our involvement in Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, and the Army does a regular, every two years, which is why it's called the biennial survey of Army families. And so here's, here's an interesting thing where they where the percentage of folks who are reporting that they handled things well or very well uh, is compared for 
families where there's never been a deployment and families where there's a current deployment. And you can see for every domain here from school, job, childcare, car maintenance, home repairs, household finances, work, transportation, there's a consistent 15 to 20 point gap between those who are deployed and those who aren't. So that tells us deployment is pretty stressful. This is a very interesting slide. Um, and this is what they talked about in children's coping. And a lot of the military people will say, well, look, half the, half the kids are coping well or very well. Um, but that means half are not coping so well. Uh, so we have a lot of concerns about this 20% of kids who are coping poorly having problems at school and at home. Um, but my concern is the parents that endorse neutral on this, like, I'm not sure what that really means. <laughs> Perhaps that the kids aren't cutting themselves or starting fires, but they're definitely not thriving. That they're kind of muddling through the day, but not their usual shining selves. That they've had some minor problems like smoking or skipping school or some lower grades, but not huge programs like running away or getting arrested, things like that. So, so these are families of uh, uh, children and families where there's deployment. The next slide I call my duh slide, which is this is um, spouse deployment and spousal satisfaction. So the number of months the soldier has been deployed and the percent of spouses that, that say they're satisfied with the Army lifestyle. <laughs> Aren't statistics wonderful? So. This is one of the other uh, slides that talks about the, the family stresses on deployment. And so this is a, um, uh, looks at the, the rate of child neglect among one and two year olds and it's given year by year because the, uh, the Army uh, Family Advocacy Program collects annual data on child abuse, child neglect, uh, spouse abuse, domestic violence. And what you see is that there are two, two it, it kind of muddles on through here about four to five, you know, maybe about three and a half to four and a half per thousand cases in all these years from like 92 to about 2001. And then what happened in 2001? A, we went to war and a lot of our soldiers deployed, and B, child neglect rates went up. The other time in our history, recent history when that's happened was also in 1990, 91. What was happening then? Yes, the Gulf War, Operation Desert Shield, Desert Storm. So, <coughs> also a colleague of mine, Deborah Gibbs, um, from the Research Triangle, of, Research Triangle Institute in North Carolina, has been studying the overlap between domestic violence and substance abuse. In addition, she's explored rates of child abuse and neglect reports among deployed versus non-deployed families. So this is for all military families. What Deborah Gibbs did was, was to compare the rates of child abuse and neglect for deployed versus non-deployed families. And she saw that the, the rate ratio or the odds ratio was 3.34. Uh, so three times as many, a uh, child was three times as likely to be abused or neglected if they lived in a deployed family than in a non-deployed family. So. Now people would think that after you've been away for a year um, that it, the reunions are, are, are happy and fraught with joy and um, you know, smooth transition back. Unfortunately, we know that's not true. Um, there are a lot of optimistic expectations. In fact, one of the studies that we did when I was assigned to the Wall Street Army Institute of Research was looking at, as looking at unit morale uh, during, the, during the year of deployment. And what we found is that um, typically morale stays high the first month when, you're over, when the person's deployed and then declines from the, about the second through the sixth month, stays low as long as you're deployed until about two months before the expected return and then comes back up. And what we, we call that deployment optimism on the far end when families are expecting to come home, expecting to be reunited with, you know, with their, their family members. And um, so we call it redeployment optimism. So. But one of, the, one of the facts is that when couples spend a year apart, each partner changes whether they're studying art in Florence or sailing solo around the world or going out of state to med school. Going across the world to fight 
in a war does change the soldier, some for good, some for bad, some just different with a mix of positives or negatives. The spouse who stays home also changes. New friends, new interests, new skills, new routines as a single parent, new spontaneity in not having to meet a spouse's needs for companionship and help on a daily basis. So there may be some unpleasant surprises if the non-deployed spouse indulged in some expensive self-care days at the, spa, at the spa or remodeled the kitchen with some unexpected expenses, that kind of thing, or dented the soldier's uh, classic 65 Mustang. <clears throat> On the other hand, returning soldiers are often reluctant to tell the stories of their worst moments in combat, uh, wanting to spare their spouse the gory details and unnecessary worry about their safety after the fact. Uh, likewise, some spouses may have chosen not to tell their soldier about some of the worst stuff that happened at home. So, and so, um, so coming back home involves kind of reintegrating into the family uh, changing once again the family patterns that have developed over the past year that have allowed the, the spouse who, who remained home uh, to kind of function and run the family as a single parent. And, uh, and so, um, and here's where we start to see some family adaptation things where we see uh, some families can return to normal. What we most often see is that in the most resilient families, we're seeing something called a new normal because both partners in the, in the adult pair have uh, grown and changed and become more independent. Most couples will say it's a little bit bumpy the first few weeks, first month or so, but then a lot of folks um, have a new appreciation of what their spouse used to take care of that, <laughs> that now they're coming back to take care of again. Um, and they've also developed some new skills. Um, we do know that there are you know, uh, increased divorce um, and referrals to counseling and things like that for uh, families right after reunion. Um, I know that when my wife Claudia was uh, assigned to the 4th Infantry Division, part of her job was to design sort of a uh, reintegration program where they had folks coming back, um, would spend a couple of weeks uh, taking courses in like, how do you deal with a teenager? So if you, if you left and your kid was 12, you come back, your child is 13, and going through puberty and real mouthy and, you know, wants you to drop them off a block away from school so nobody knows that they're with their lame parents, that kind of thing. So, so one of the questions we want to ask is, when we look at the three phases of this deployment, what has a year of deployment brought to this family? So all I've done in this next slide is superimpose the last three family things, uh, pre-deployment, deployment, and post-deployment, on what hap has happened in the last year. So, one of the things that we know, so here's a summary of all the stuff that the families had to deal with to support the one-year deployment. Back in the 1960s, Holmes and Ray developed something called a life change unit scale. Are you familiar with that? So on a, on a scale of zero to 100 points, they ranked, uh, they assigned points to the, um, the intensity of a change that someone uh, had experienced. So death of a spouse or a child would be 100 points, getting a traffic ticket uh, or taking out a, a bank loan would be 10 points. And then they added all, up all, of the, all of the occurrences of whatever those stresses were over a year. And if you had 300 points, um, then your chance, and they were actually able to figure out your odds of getting ill or being in some kind of accident based on how many life change units or how much stress you'd experienced in the last year. And they're, they're pretty accurate in that. And one of the scary things is that for most military families, the number of life change units that they rack up just on a regular move from one peacetime base to another peacetime base usually is 350 to 400. So people starting and stopping work, selling a home, buying a car, you know, moving problems with in-laws, moving in with in-laws, moving, <laughs> moving out of in-laws, things like that. So, <clears throat> so, um, so you can see how um, there are a lot of different areas that are affected by this. Now, one of the, one of the things that we, um, that we dealt with <clears throat> at Walter Reed uh, was the special case of when deployment is sort of interrupted by a soldier's injury. It's one of the things that families worry about during deployment, one of the things soldiers worry about too. Um, but when that happens, things change pretty rapidly. So. <clears throat> So there are a lot of, so there's an initial crisis of whether the soldier will survive and what their level of recovery or what their level of disability will be. 
for most soldiers that I've worked with, there's a crisis of meaning, and that meaning boils down to one thing. Can I still be a soldier? There's often disruption and dislocation during recovery. Um, the Army has some state-of-the-art uh, trauma treatment centers, but they're not here in Cleveland. There's one in San Antonio, Brook Army Medical Center. There's one in Washington, D.C., Walter Reed, and there's one, the Naval Hospital in San Diego that are the designated you know, severe trauma treatment centers. Um, and then the VA has, what, five polytrauma treatment centers that handle folks after they've already been discharged from the military. So um, one of the programs, one of the support programs that the military has is um, a program called the non-medical attendant program. So, um, so if a soldier gets blown up in Afghanistan and is, and is medevac to Walter Reed, the Army will pay for travel for one non-medical attendant. So a spouse, a parent, a sibling will fly to Walter Reed. They had uh, a place called the Malone House, which is a hotel on the campus. They give them a daily stipend. Um, you know, they pay for their room. They give them a daily stipend to eat. And their job is to be there with their family member. Because sometimes these, spou these soldiers are so severely injured that they have to do some medical decision making. Um, and one of the things that we know from military medical practice is that if your spouse or a family member is there with you, the, the soldiers tend to do a lot better. So, <clears throat> but for a lot of these families, because here we're talking about uh, many uh, relatively young soldiers in their 20s who are married and have kids who are under the age of five, uh, and a lot of uh, disruption happens bringing the, bringing the spouse to Walter Reed because then the grandparents are moving into their house to live with, the, with their kids or the kids are going to live with the grandparents or sometimes a single spouse is bringing two kids to two kids under five to the Walter Reed. Sometimes they bring school age children and just yank them out of school. Daddy's injured, we're going. Um, and so there were a lot of challenges for the Walter Reed staff in terms of uh, arranging childcare for, the ch for these younger children, for uh, some kind of tutoring or schooling for the school age children. Um, and um, help trying to support the spouse as they're uh, going through their soldier's um, recovery and treatment. So, um, and so one of the, the natures about this injury is that when, with these injuries with a relatively young, pretty uh, healthy population, other than the injury, is that we've seen some pretty remarkable recoveries of folks who are um, pretty severely injured who've recovered both rapidly and, and fairly completely. So, um, and so, but for some folks that are missing limbs, that for whom their military service is over, there's this huge piece of, of helping them redefine their roles uh, as what am I gonna be if I can't be a soldier? Uh, what does this disability mean for me? What does it mean for my family? Can I still provide for my family? And so there's a huge piece of redefining the family identity after disability as well. And then uh, finally, one thing that hasn't been talked about much about is restoration of marital intimacy after injury. So the thing a lot of people don't think about is explosions that are powerful enough to rip someone's legs off often do damage to the other soft tissues of the reproductive system. And so ha helping families deal with that part, either the loss of sexual functioning or uh, delay in return to sexual intimacy or having to do things a lot differently um, after injury is a huge piece that couples are very uncomfortable talking about. And what we found is that many clinicians are also uncomfortable raising the issue and talking about that as well. So here's the, the issue of injury and how that impacts uh, uh, injury. And so we've talked about some of these things already. The notification of the injury in itself is definitely a stressor and can, is definitely a crisis. <coughs> we've dealt with a lot of, um, a lot of uh, families where there are extended family, there are conflicts w between the spouse who may have only been married um, for a few months. Uh, a lot of a lot of a common pattern amongst deploying soldiers is that they're marrying their girlfriend so that she can have PX and commissary privileges and health care while the soldiers deployed, um, and sometimes they haven't been dating all that long. So if the, if the soldier gets blown up and comes back and is in a coma, <coughs> who makes a decision about? Um, about sort of um, end of life care if it's very severely this 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 uh, spouse who they've. He's been deployed longer than they've been married, um, or their family. 
So, and some of these are guys in their, you know, soldiers in their young 20s, things like that. So, so, so there have been some very difficult cases, sort of of not quite of the legal impact, but if you think of the Terry Schiavo case about wanting to pull the plug, this husband wanting to um, withdraw life support measures versus the family that wanted to keep everything going and the, the level of um, vitriol and political <laughs> football playing that went around without that. We've had a few of those happen at Walter Reed as well. Um, there was a huge scandal. One of the reasons I went to war work at Walter Reed, I went to work there in 2007 after I retired. In 2006 was when they had that huge scandal about uh, the delays in, in medical board processing, things like that. I wanted to go there to be part of the solution and help to, to fix that. Um, although Walter Reed does provide, you know, the non-medical attendant support program, folks would get cabin fever and things like that. Um, a lot of the sports spouses are torn between the needs of their injured soldier versus the needs of their children. Um, so uh, family problems and coping skills are often compromised if there's been a, uh, a traumatic brain injury because that may affect their cognitive skills, uh, it may affect their tolerance for frustration and, and mood issues, things like that. Um, situational appraisal in terms of are we still a military family and the decision of whether to fight to try to stay in versus folks who um, were, um, or should we take a medical retirement and leave. <clears throat> so working with a, coll a colleague from the National Center for Complementary and Alternative Medicine at the NIH, we looked at how to address the pileup of stressors that affected the non-medical attendants. Um, mostly spouses that were living at Walter Reed while their soldier was being treated. So drawing on training in mind-body medicine, we started a caregiver skills workshop that we called Project Comfort. This was an eight session group workshop to teach mind-body relaxation skills, address some caregiver burden issues, and also to teach Reiki relaxation to spouses of injured soldiers. We drew our participants from spouses of soldiers who were attending the, the PALS group. PALS standard per, stood for Promoting Amputee Life Skills Group. And so we scheduled our sessions for the spouses at the same time their soldiers were attending that group so the two group would not interfere with other therapy activities. <clears throat> Most of the participants were families that had been around a while. Their husbands were all uh, outpatients. The stumps of the amputations were mostly healing. They'd been fitted with prosthetics and were learning to get around using their new arms and legs. Uh, we had one, one new client that, or one new spouse that was brought into our class whose husband had just been medevaced to Walter Reed. He would lost both arms and a leg and was in a medically induced coma. And, um, and they asked, the social worker on, the, on that unit asked if that person could come in, that spouse could come into our group as well. So, um, uh, and this was, a, this was a situation also where there was a lot of family conflict, so. Um, but basically, the eights, uh, the, our pilot project was designed to teach spouses of injured, injured soldiers some injury-specific caregiving skills to help the recovery of their injured soldier. So this is teaching spouses caregiving skills. Reducing caregiver burden by providing them with some mind-body techniques to reduce stress. Teach uh, spouses of their soldiers how to provide a comforting relaxation technique that's called Reiki. Are you all familiar with that? Most of you have heard of that. <clears throat> provide a venue for social support easing the stress of reunion in, between spouses and soldiers, and giving them a, a context where they could talk about these things. And then, of course, we collected program evaluation data. <coughs> Our program structure, basically, we ended up, of course, having nine sessions instead of eight sessions. <laughs> um, and so basically, um, each, each session would have three phases to it in the two-hour session. Phase one was teaching a mind-body medicine skill. Uh, deep breathing, therapeutic music, exercise, uh, like we did yoga, nutrition, prayer and meditation, self-hypnosis, and then um, uh, we did some, yeah, we did some specific meditation skills. And then the last two sessions we did help them develop a personalized wellness plan. So the idea was to give them a whole, uh, like a cafeteria, a whole menu of different things that they could try. They got a chance to try. Some people found one thing that really worked for them. Others found other things that worked for them. The second thing, the second phase was a kind of a guided discussion group about some of these different aspects of, uh, of caregiving and introducing the is issues about the role of a caregiver, how things change in a relationship, caregiver burden, things like that. And then 
ways of living with that. And then phase three was basically a 16-hour uh, a Reiki workshop uh, divided up into like nine different sessions. So the workshop was held in a bright lit conference room at the top of our building and we got a grant to provide healthy snacks. Um, and because uh, we found the spouse's eating patterns were pretty disrupted and they're, they're eating a lot of you know, vending machine food at odd hours as they're waiting for their husband's surgery and things like that. So then the final thing we did was a uh, program evaluation. And, uh, um, and so here's, um, so we had, uh, we had one student who left midway to have a baby. <laughs> so, and we expected her to return, but she didn't. Um, so, uh, so we had data on five spouses. We actually got, we had one where we had not only pre-test and post-test you know, at the beginning, at the end of the session, but also six weeks post. Because <coughs> one, one woman had gone home and we mailed her the follow-up questionnaires, never got a response, um, sent her um, a follow-up, which she completed six weeks later uh, that we got the same day we got her original post-test. Because of course, Walter Reed and Mailer, remember the anthrax scare of 1998? Yeah, okay, well, well, some of that stuff showed up at Walter Reed. So all the mail you know, that arrives at Walter Reed has to go through a separate processing facility and screen for anthrax. <coughs> so here are the changes and strains, pre and post-test. So these are, this is kind of like the stressors. <coughs> what we found that was that Virtually all of our participants reported that uh, they were experiencing fewer stressors and fewer strains in their relationship after the workshop than the before. This is the direction we wanted to move, correct? <laughs> okay. This is the golden slide. The rest of them are more mixed. Again, st no statistical significance. We have very small n of five people. Um, and, um, and of course, Definitely not controlled conditions because if you're going to do a you know a randomized clinical trial, you have all the exclusionary uh, criteria, the inclusionary criteria. The only inclusionary criteria we had was spouse of an injured soldier. So, um, <coughs> so here was uh, again. These are all part of the FIRA M, the Family Index of Regenerativity Adaptation. Again, from the Bible here, from my prop. <laughs> Um, and so again, we found, um, so on self-reliance, we found that two students, or two of our uh, students, we call them students, not patients or clients, because we're trying to work with this as to depathologize it, destigmatize it. This is a skills workshop, caregiver skills workshop, where we wanted to focus on building skills, not identifying pathology. So we call them students. Uh, so again, um, two stay about the same. Um, and in this case, femoral self-reliance, uh, two actually went down. Um, so, um, where's number five? We only have data on four people. That's interesting. I never noticed that before. <clears throat> the family coherence, that sort of cohesion, stick to itiveness, um, we found a, kind of a mixed bag where. Um, this person kind of was doing better right after, and then six weeks after she went home was kind of back, well, sort of where she started from. A couple that got, three that got better, one that got worse. <coughs> and a lot of this, you know, with such small numbers, a lot of this is based on what is happening with the individuals. We had one person, one of our spouses got extremely frustrated because they had gotten uh, miles, flight miles donated from other people so they get to flight home to go home for the holidays with her husband, his first trip back home since the injury. And at the last minute, they canceled it because they had to schedule another surgery. She was one pissed off lady, and it showed. <laughs> it showed, because she found out about that like a day before our last session when we're giving the, uh, the follow-up questionnaires. So um, this is our social support index pre and post. Uh, we found a couple that had gotten better um, and a couple that had gotten worse. Um, family adaptation checklist. Uh, this is um, the outcome, sort of how the family had adapted. So we found this lady was exactly the same uh, <clears throat> at all three points in time. <coughs> we had two that improved, another one that was the same, and one person who reported things did not go well. This is the lady who was told she couldn't go home with her husband at the last minute. 
and this is the, their, their sense of well-being. So again, this is the lady whose husband was blown up uh, and was a triple amputee. This is when she's going through the worst of the family conflict where, where his father, <coughs> his mother, who he's <coughs> excuse me, estranged from, uh, told him that um, uh, when she went home to Atlanta to pick up her two -year -old, their two-year-old son, the mother came by and said, you know, she's not going to stay with you, so you should really come home and live with us, because she wanted to get his, uh, um, his SGLI, his soldier's uh, amp traumatic amputation, life insurance, and get his medical disability. <coughs> so things got really, so in terms of extended family support, you can see why that, you know, well-being kind of like went down to the, to the toilet on that one. But a couple of them also, so three of our five spouses uh, reported uh, that things were going, or well-being was better. Um, we also di did not rely only on the FIRA M. We also looked at uh, a measure called the OQ45 outcome questionnaire, 45 questions about general mental health and general well-being. <clears throat> on this, um, 35 is the, uh, 36 is the clinical cutoff here. <coughs> And this is the SD subscale subjective distress. And one of the things this told us was that none of these people um, were anywhere close to the clinical cutoffs for people that look more like folks who are engaged in mental health counseling versus a more normal population. So, so our first kind of guess was supported that these are not people that are crazy or dysfunctional, but these are folks who are actually pretty normal people that are going through a very abnormal, stressful situation. Um, and uh, again, because of the things that were happening, um, two of the folks actually were encountering more distress further on due to their spouses, uh, their injured soldiers' issues. Uh, one stayed about the same and two improved. Uh, same thing is with the dyadic adjustment scale, uh, pre and post test scores. And again here, higher is better. So um, we had two that uh, went down and three that went up. So, so and <clears throat> because I went to the Mandel School um, and was taught to use mixed method technology, I see Dr. Singer back there smiling, we also asked for them to make some comments about what personal growth have you noticed in the last nine weeks? And we got lots of good feedback from them. Um, <clears throat> and so, um, yeah, so we got a lot of good, um, uh, a lot of good uh, feedback from them that helped us plan our second, um, our, our second time through that. And, and we did a second round of that, which was, uh, had, a f had fewer people signing up because we were not able to do it at the same time as the PALS group. So let me skip through since I'm down to about two minutes now. I see Betsy over there with the, with the clock. <clears throat> so, um, So, I got through quite a few of these. <laughs> so basically, um, we got a lot of good ideas about how to make this better. We implemented the ideas. We got some, um, some good feedback, um, verbal feedback for them, as well as some measurable feedback. And <clears throat> right about that time was when I left Walter Reed and came over to the Vet Center. So, um, so what I'd like to share with you are some resources for families that, um, that are available. And I believe, are these slides going to be posted on the website? Yes, they will be saved. Okay. <clears throat> right. So, um, so the Defense Veterans Brain Injury Center, Deployment Health Clinical Center, Military One Source, these are some military resources. <clears throat> the VA, of course, med centers and vet centers. Uh, and then there are a number of private organizations that um, that support um, uh, veterans who have been injured, veterans uh, who are in need of, of care. I think the one that I didn't mention there is the Wounded Warrior Project, because everybody has seen the commercials. Um, <clears throat> and then, then the DOD has a number of uh, partnerships. And one of the things that was just starting when I was working at Walter Reed was the VA seamless transition workers that were actually placed in, in, in Army and Navy hospitals to help make the transition from military care to VA care. So. One of the things, and actually where you ended up, was resources um, for veterans and families. We hear a lot about VA time lags 
inability for people to get to resources, even though they're kind of listed, what's been your experience with that? <clears throat> well, <clears throat> the area of the VA where I work, um, we're part of the Veterans Health Administration, which provides medical care. Um, the vet centers um, uh, being small outpatient units placed out in the community, um, we don't have a waiting list, either electronic or on paper. We're not supposed, nobody in the VA is supposed to have a paper waiting list. Um, <clears throat> and we can generally get folks in for counseling within a couple of days. Um, <clears throat> part of that is that our population are folks that are eligible through either combat service or being a military sexual trauma survivor. So we're not getting every single veteran um, that's been in the military. We're primarily getting um, um, combat veterans and survivors of military sexual trauma. And, um, and we're pretty adequately resourced to, to provide that. So, does that answer your question? So there are, there, you know, I'm sure most folks have read that there have been issues with delays in care and things like that in the larger VA that <clears throat> has to do with a lot of veterans electing to use the VA for their care. Uh, when I first started in 2009 at the vet center, <clears throat> my first dozen clients were all Vietnam veterans who were aging into their 60s, um, who had, uh, and every one of them had lost their job, lost their spouse, lost their house, lost their health insurance. You know, many were couch surfing at a friend's house, things like that. Um, and much of my early work with the vet center was helping these folks um, get access to VA medical care so they could get a prostate screening or you know blood pressure medication, get their diabetes, test strips again, things like that. Because, because right when the economy turned down like that, um, a lot of these folks lost everything and they found themselves without any health care at all. So, so there's been a huge, so we have this kind of double whammy in the VA right now of <clears throat> Vietnam veterans who are aging into their 60s where they need more and more medical care from some of the many common things that happen to folks in their 60s, uh, medical conditions. <clears throat> and at the same time, you've got the returning OIF, OEF uh, veterans. Not only those with a lot of combat injuries that we've seen, but one of, the, one, of the, one of the entitlements that returning veterans have is that for the first five years after returning for, from a deployment, uh, or if they've been deployed for the first five years after they get out of the military, they're eligible for complete health care through the VA system. So you have kind of this double doubled effect of, of folks that are coming from both the senior category of Vietnam veterans as well as our recently returning veterans. And that's part of what's created the backlog. <clears throat> and we can't hire enough mental health clinicians in the VA. So if you want a job when you get your MSW, <clears throat> or if you want a job when you get your PhD, come work for us. <clears throat> Other questions, Kathy. Uh, thank you, Mark. Thank you, Mark, for your presentation. This is an unfair question. So, can I give so, you an unfair answer? It's unfair, yeah. So, the double ABCX model that you used, I think, is a really good one in terms mm -hmm. of the cyclical nature of deployment that you laid mm -hmm. out. So, given what you've learned from your intervention, could you make any kind of prediction about the kinds of services that might be helpful in the pre deployment phase? you know, kind of like going back and, okay. and looking at that? <clears throat> That's a good question. In fact, the, the Army has kind of answered that question in some ways, in that <clears throat> they developed a whole series of classes, both for soldiers and for spouses, and they called it Battle Mind. And part of what they talked about were some of the issues that, that I raised here, which was, um, you know, not only just the standard things of did you get your shots and is your will up to date and do you have a next of kin notification, all that up to date, those kinds of things, but also <clears throat> you know, some classes about um, how to maintain communications and you know, thinking before you hit the send button. Do you, if you're a spouse at home, do you really want to tell your deployed soldier overseas who's running convoys, your son just got arrested or you know, things like that. Um, so things about communication, things about handling family finances, because uh, that's been a huge thing, especially with online ordering, 
A lot of soldiers who are deployed can order things from the, the PX catalog online. And so they're ordering all this World War II memorabilia and spending lots of money while their spouse back home is dealing with a busted washing machine and bouncing checks and things like that. So, and then also they talked a lot about um, the whole battle mind part, which is getting yourself uh, sort of like getting your game face on in terms of soldiers are good at that and they've talked a lot about with soldiers about getting into a combat area, situational awareness, dealing with the mission, how to deal with uh, casualties or losses in your unit. They never talk to spouses about stuff like that. And so part of what they talk about is developing this resilience perspective of, okay, I know it's gonna be tough, how am I gonna get through this? Developing a plan for how do I get through this? Um, who are gonna be my social supports? When am I gonna get some respite from the kids? Do I have a, a friend who'll take the kids so I can have a day at the spa or, or go go kart racing or whatever it is I like to do, that kind of thing. So, um, so they were able to do that both pre and then also post. So. This will be the last question. Oh. Are advanced directives mandatory before deployment? Yes. They are? As far as I know, yes. But mm -hmm. there's so many complications with who makes decisions? Correct. Okay. Just because there are complications, I mean, just because there's an advanced directive doesn't mean there's not conflict. It helps resolve the conflict, but um, <clears throat> a lot of folks will. And that's one of the reasons why they do the advanced directives. So, and usually they'll, they'll list a person as a medical power of attorney who can make those decisions. So, a very good question. Thank you. Thank you. I want to, um, oh gee, that's not loud. Let's thank Dr. Shea. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> oh. And we have Lisa Pate, who's, who's going to join us now. I'm Lisa Pape, again, from the Department of Veterans Affairs. I'm the Executive Director for uh, VA, VHA Homeless Programs. And I'm delighted to be here today. I was so flattered when uh, Betsy contacted me to ask me uh, to join and uh, share the work we've been doing with homeless veterans. Um, and also, of course, to kick off this 100-year celebration, the theme, I think, I hope I have this right, inspiring hope and shaping the future. And I hope today uh, that uh, I can inspire some hope in all of you that with the right ingredients, changes can be made in systems that really do shape the future. If you would have asked me in 1990 when I graduated from MSAS, it was called MSAS at the time, the Mandel School, um, we we're gonna try and end homelessness. I, I would have laughed, right? I would be like, ending homelessness. And I even felt that way uh, five years ago, like end homelessness. But today I'm gonna show you um, some of the great progress we've made and uh, the use of research and policy and uh, implementing that into practice that has made a huge difference uh, for us at the Department of Veterans Affairs. So our goal is to a systemic end to homelessness by the end of 2015. That's like in 90 days, not that we're counting, uh, but we are. <laughs> uh, and um, the ultimate goal is to ensure that all homeless uh, or at-risk veterans have some kind of permanent sustainable housing. This is a big deal because uh, our president, our first lady, and uh, two cabinet level secretaries at the time, Secretary Shinseki for the Department of Veterans Affairs and Secretary Cash, uh, excuse me, Secretary Donovan from Housing and Urban Development all stood forward and said, we can't have veterans living on the streets. It's a travesty um, and you all have to help uh, correct this. People who have served our nation should not have to live outside. So the president asked uh, federal agencies to cut out barriers and find ways to improve, cut, basically cut through the red tape and improve a veteran's ability to uh, get housed or stay housed. And um, as I said, it's a, let me go back here, a systemic end to homelessness. So what that means for us is zero homeless veterans on the streets, that there's actually no veteran that has to sleep outside and about 12,500 is okay to be living in some kind of transitional housing or shelter situation. 
Um, and so the big picture, I, I just want to give you some context here so that you know what we're dealing with. In January of 2014, we did this point in time count, and HUD runs this, and, and they do it every year and look at uh, where we literally go into the streets the last 10 days of January and count, people are shaking their heads, and count homeless people who are living on the streets. And so in 2014, across the nation, uh, there was about 578,000 homeless people living on the streets. Uh, of that, about 49,933 were identified as veterans. Now that's a point in time, so that's on any given night. Uh, usually uh, that number's doubled if you're going to look at it, at it as an annual number. So 100,000 homeless veterans living on the streets. About 15% of those are chronically homeless. Chronically are those who have lived on the streets for a year or longer, or they have four episodes over the last three years that total up some number of days, uh, makes you chronic. And these are usually veterans with some kind of serious mental illness or serious addiction. So it, this kind of gives you the context of uh, where, where the numbers are. And uh, the big reason is, is affordable housing. Basically, there's just not enough affordable housing. And uh, then you couple that with all these psychosocial issues that we all identify as, as social workers, um, and it becomes pretty complex. The good news, and, and this slide shows this. Let me see if I got the pointer right. I don't know how to do the pointer. So, but the good news is that there's been a 33% decrease of homeless veterans living on the street. If you look at 2010, when we were asked to run this initiative to today, there's a 33% increase or decrease. And you can see the light green line is the unsheltered, and that's been where our focus has been. That number has decreased by 43%. So we really focused on homeless veterans who were living outside to try to get them uh, some kind of transitional housing or permanent housing. So this is where I hope I'm inspiring hope, because who would have thought that you could decrease any social issue by 33% in four short years? It just doesn't happen. Um, and with the right ingredients and the right focus and the right leadership uh, involvement, um, a lot can happen. This slide uh, just gives you some perspective of the number of veterans who actually enter VA homeless programs. We have a huge continuum of homeless and at-risk programs to serve homeless veterans, and some that can even serve their families. And so back in 2010, we had about 127,000 veterans enter our homeless programs. Uh, by 2014, uh, that number uh, more than doubled. 268,000 veterans actually enter into VA homeless or at-risk programs. And that doesn't even count um, the family members. In some programs, as I said, we can serve family members. Uh, and we have one program that has served over 30,000 children of veterans who have been homeless. And that's like huge, right? So uh, we're, we're able to offer that assistance. Also just know about 15% are OIF, OEF, or OND, Operation Iraqi Freedom, Enduring Freedom, or Operation New Dawn from the, the newer wars. Um, 10 to 12% are female veterans, and our average age is about 53 years old. So that's who's entering our programs. So this is the number of veterans that we've actually placed in permanent housing. The name of the game for us is housing veterans, right? That's what we want to do. We don't want people to live on the streets or live in transitional housing. We want to provide them with housing uh, and then wrap services around them. And uh, this past year to date, we've already housed 57,200 people. And so now I know you're doing the math. How do you have 49,000 on one night, but you house 57? There's an, a constant inflow. And we, we don't have our finger or thumb on the pulse of that yet, but we know that number is actually, we think that number is increasing a little bit. And so we're looking at that to um, touch those at-risk people and right stopping the inflow, because if you can stop the inflow, uh, you can um, help those people who are at risk and never have to uh, deal with that crisis. This shows the acuity level, and you, you'll see it's, it goes in line a little bit of, of what Mark was saying. You'll see that substance abuse problems among the population that enters our, our uh, programs has gone down, but the age has gone up. We have this big aging 
issue, which becomes really huge, right? So you have 60-year-olds who are living on the streets, and after years of that, medical conditions get much worse and much more chronic. So a lot of uh, high blood pressure, diabetes, chronic joint issues all become really intense for this population. Um, and you see that the chronic population, which is the um, darker blue, um, has stayed has gone down a little bit because um, that's that, that's that top. I guess it's green on here. It's blue on mine. <laughs> that we focused on that population, so you can see that uh, with targeted intervention, numbers uh, will decrease. This is where I want to put a plug in. Mark did a little bit, and I will too. Um, I'll just mention that. Um, in order to do any of the progress we've done, uh, VA has a huge uh, staff that focus on homeless veterans. And uh, we have over 4,000 employees across the nation and 152 medical centers that uh, work on homeless uh, issues for veterans or in homeless programs. We employ about 12,000 social workers across the nation. I think we're the largest employer of social workers uh, in the uh, Veterans Health Administration. And um, nearly 1,400 uh, are trained each year at our medical centers. It's a great training ground. I, I trained on an acute psych unit um, for my second year practicum, the biggest eye-opening experience of my life. I um, had not worked with acute psychotically uh, acting veterans or anybody uh, before, and it just gave me a really nice foundation to understand what's going on out in the world because I grew up in a middle class family in a suburb here of, of Cleveland and just didn't have that experience. We um, also have a little over 900 uh, of these students who get stipends through the VA and the other 500 uh, just come to us because we're such a good training ground. So just know that's out there. Um, VA is a, a huge supporter of social workers and we have many social workers. In fact, uh, um, many of my senior leads are running national programs, are uh, social workers. And I think I have one psychologist because I had to. <laughs> So we know uh, a, a lot about veterans homelessness and it's not a homogeneous population. Um, we are a little overrepresented in the homeless population. When I started, uh, somewhere between 13 and 16% of homeless persons were veterans, which is a far huge uh, overrepresentation. We're down to 9%. We see that number continually going down. We think it's because of all the resources and targeted efforts and um, over 8,000 veterans since 2005 have actually received services in homeless programs. This, uh, this picture gives, uh, gives you some context of how we're, we're situated to serve homeless veterans. And I wish, I, Mark, how do you do this? Is there the pointer, the red dot? Oh, is there, mine's a green dot. I kind of do. Oh, is that what it was? So there's a little pointer here. So, so down here is the um, foundational pillars that we built our programs on. We got together when, when the president said you have to end homelessness. We um, sat down as a uh, group at the VA to say, what is it that we actually need? What needs to happen to end homelessness? And we knew we had to do outreach, two kinds, clinical outreach, and then outreach to educate people about this population. Um, we knew we had to do something for prevention because you have to stop that inflow. Of course, you have to provide treatment, specifically substance abuse and mental health treatment, but also medical health treatment because these folks are sick. Um, we needed to do something around housing, of course, and permanent supported housing. And then what the VA uh, knows well is we can do a lot, and we do do a lot, but we can't do everything. We're bound by so many laws and regulations and rules. We needed community partnerships. Um, so that people could uh, pick up where the gaps were. And some of those are um, treating spouses and families. Um, I, I do have two programs that can do that, but most of our programs and most of the VA cannot do interventions for children, spouses, or families. And so for sure, our community partners are a big piece of that. Uh, up here um, is, a, a, we also need a 24-7 rapid response. 
uh, interventions, which we're still aspiring to. We do have a call center that will answer the phone, most phones 24-7. We do have some outreach centers across the nation that run 24-7, so if someone is found homeless at midnight, they don't have to sit in an ER. We can get them to, to our outreach centers and, and uh, start to get them the treatment they need. And of course, uh, up on top are all the federal partners. Uh, let me, see, and the veteran is right there. So they get wrapped around with all these services, federal, state, local, um, nonprofit organizations uh, to really um, have an all-in approach. Our plan was a no wrong door. So we needed all of this to make sure there's no wrong door because not any single agency can do this alone. So what that meant for us really is a, a new operations management framework, right? We mostly acted as a, a, a crisis response system. So we waited till somebody fell into homelessness and then we'd send our outreach workers out to the shelter and find that person living in the shelter and then get them wrapped around services so that they could start to get the treatment and care and housing that they needed. Um, so we wanted to change that mindset that we're not a crisis management. Let's not wait till people fall into homelessness. Let's really change how we think about this. And so we had to realign and align operations across 152 medical centers and um, a number of uh, outpatient clinics that you'll see popped up all over the nation. But not only do we have to align what they each could do, we had to align their thinking. So we're not gonna be crisis, we're, we're actually gonna end homelessness. And to end homelessness, you have to do a whole bunch of other stuff besides just combing the streets looking for homeless people. Um, and that is a work in progress uh, because changing a system, the VA has 300,000 employees, 152 medical centers, 800 outpatient clinics, that's huge. That's like, you can't switch that overnight. Um, but, it, but we are changing it, um, and I'll continue to talk more about that. Um, but it can be done, and so I hope I'm still inspiring hope in you. Um, we had to, to, to really do that, we had to promote implementation of evidence-based practice. We had to use research, right? We had to con convince people that we can get to zero homelessness, and, and here are the evidence-based strategies that can get us there. Our biggest that we use, and I'll talk about this later, is permanent supported housing. Some of you may have heard of the housing first approach, uh, which has been wildly successful in New York uh, specifically and, and in LA. And then we had to provide tools to measure, right, so that people knew things were happening, dashboards and uh, smart cards and targets, so also that folks know what you're doing is making a difference and uh, with continuous improvement, making tweaks where we needed to make tweaks. And then we, what we did was set up a hub so that uh, people who worked in the homeless programs could look at other VAs and what they were doing and take their best practices and implement uh, or make changes to their practices to uh, implement new things as they saw what worked at other VAs. I'm gonna show a quick video here. <gasps> In Ted Talk, I'm Mary Mantle. The VA has agreed to create housing for thousands of Southern California homeless veterans. With us to talk about the deal is the U.S. Secretary of Veterans Affairs, Robert McDonald. You've said that you think it is possible to end homelessness for veterans in Southern California by the end of the year. The, the big idea here, uh, Larry, is the first step to ending homelessness is for the community to come together. All of you who committed yourselves, not just counting. That's Mayor Garcetti of LA. But finding each individual story that's on our street center. Because while this is a city of so much, it's also a place that alongside the LA River, our freeway off ramps, and underneath our freeways, here in Skid Row and throughout the city, there are thousands too many people who are homeless. One of the things you learn in the Army, and you learn in military service in this country, is you never leave a buddy behind. Whether the person's alive or they're dead, we never leave somebody behind. Well, unfortunately, we've left some people behind. There are homeless veterans. But I'm here to tell you that we at VA are totally committed.
committed to helping the city of Los Angeles, helping the mayor, helping all of you achieve that goal of ending veterans' homelessness by the end of this year. So this is cool, and why it's cool, you know, um, Secretary McDonald is a cabinet member. He's 16th in line to become president, and he's out there with me and, and many of our colleagues on Skid Row counting homeless veterans, very committed to ending veterans' homelessness. And every city that he goes to visit, he, has, he talks about this initiative. And why is that important? Because if you want policy and practice to change, you get top leadership. So who's who's who does Secretary or excuse me, Secretary McDonald report to? The president. So we have top leadership uh, out there talking about ending veterans' homelessness. And I'll just give an aside. I went to Skid Row, like life-changing experience. Went went to Skid Row. We counted at midnight or 10 o'clock at night. Homeless veterans, and LA has the largest homeless population than any other city. They say there's something like three or four thousand homeless veterans living out in LA, and LA's huge, right? So it's this spread out huge city. Four thousand homeless veterans, probably six or seven thousand homeless people, just living there, and it it was. Um, like deplorable to see people sleeping on the concrete in tents. Mind you, there's no bathrooms, right? It's not like the city's putting up uh, porta potties for them. So you can imagine the smells. People are psychotic, um, walking around down there, not on medications. Um, there's families, and it it just uh, just reignites my own passion that. Um, really nobody should ever in the United States have to live on the streets. And to see that just uh, is, it's just unbelievable that we ha let that happen. And then to have the support of a secretary, and he's not the only secretary, Secretary Perez from Labor is involved, Secretary Castro from the Housing and Ur Urban Development, Secretary Burwell from HHS, all of them um, sit at a quarterly meeting and talk about what do we need to do to end homelessness. And we couldn't be uh, more blessed uh, to have that kind of leadership involvement. Also, um, because this is caught on in videos like this we, we promote, uh, Michelle Obama is involved and has um, gone to New Orleans. There's several cities that have raised their hands to say we've ended homelessness and we've vetted. And Michelle Obama is also out there with us saying this can happen and should happen. And I'm stressing that because it's so important no matter what level uh, 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 staff you are in your organization, you just got to get the highest level you can get to to get to buy into this. For us, it happens to be the secretary and the president, um, which helps when you have a national initiative. <laughs> but, you, but, but you don't have to do a national initiative. You just have to do something small in your city. And so getting to your agency director, getting uh, to the city council, the county government, the mayors, um, which which we've also done called a mayor's challenge. You can Google it, I won't talk a lot about it. Um, but it's to, we got mayors to actually step forward and say we'll end veterans homelessness by the end of 2015. There's over 700 mayors who said they would do it. New Orleans was one of them, Mayor Landro. Policy snap shot. So how does all of this fit, right? So Americans with the lowest incomes are facing increasingly desperate circumstances, particularly related to housing. Incomes at the bottom of the labor market remain stagnant. We know that, right? Uh, dis despite our recovery, while rents continue to go up. In a uh, source called Out of Reach 2014, you can Google this. It's from the National Low Income Housing Coalition. Research shows that there are actually no states, not one of our states, in which a full-time minimum wage worker can afford a one-bedroom or a two-bedroom rental unit at farm fair market rent without exceeding 30% of income on housing. So everyone's heard that, right? You shouldn't buy a house more than 30%. There's not one state that gives um, a minimum wage worker the opportunity to rent a um, one or two-bedroom apartment. In DC, where I'm at, 
just to put context to this, a two bedroom apartment costs um, at, farm, at fair market rent is $1,469 a month. That means in order to afford this level of rent with utilities without paying more than 30%, a household has to earn $4,800 a month. Like, right? Like, right? At minimum wage, we're working at Home Depot or Dollar Store, or, right? The, who, what grocery stores do you have? I have Giant, Giant Eagle. You guys have Giant Eagle? Like, it's not going to happen. And that housing wage translates to $28.25 an hour. I talked to students um, before here, and I asked what was the starting wage for a social worker, and, and they said doing good was like $25 an hour, right? Like, affordable housing is a major issue for us. So what are our, our pile, uh, policy priorities in the VA, right? Make sure that our programs continue to get funded so that we can close the gaps. We can't build housing by law, and we can't um, raise minimum wage, not our bailiwick, but we can continue to ensure that we're um, wrapping services around people who are going to deal with the struggles that I'm talking about. And uh, we have a $1.4 billion budget. Um, four years ago, five, uh, five years ago now, um, when I uh, took this job and raised my hand and said I would do this, which I'm really glad I did, it's just really challenging, um, our budget was $257 million. So with, right, with the stuff I'm talking about, talking to Congress, talking to cities, counties, mayors, um, working with cabinet level people, um, uh, the VA has been able to get $1.4 billion to help uh, support these homeless veterans who may never actually afford a place to live. We also have to ensure housing, um, and we're working with our partners in, in HUD, um, Housing and Urban Development, to, um, and our community partners to build uh, affordable housing. And so there's many, many housing developers across the nation that raise their hand and say, we'll do things like getting tax credits, which nobody asked me a question about that. I don't know that much about it. But I know they get reimbursed in some way for building housing that is affordable for people with disabilities or veterans or, and the populations we work with so that there's more opportunities for our veterans to uh, move out of the streets. And uh, HUD also provides Section 8 vouchers to veterans. Um, and it's a, it's a program called HUD-VASH. HUD gives a voucher. It's Section 8. It's low income, but they're targeted and dedicated to veterans. VA provides case management to these veterans so that they don't cycle in and out of homelessness. So you get this voucher. You can have it for life. And then you participate in us uh, in VA giving wraparound services. And then there's one other population that we can't serve, but it's really important because it counts in that big 49,900 number. It's those veterans that are other than honorable discharges from the military. VA by law can't serve those, and they're discharged for various reasons. Sometimes they didn't do enough time. Uh, if you do under two years or 180 days, you, you're not eligible for VA services. Um, if you get discharged for um, a bad conduct or a bad reason, you may not be able to get uh, services at the VA. And some of these vets also um, had been discharged under uh, when it was don't ask, don't tell. And so they don't qualify for services. We're working on, on uh, reversing those kind of decisions. But there's about 15 to 30 percent of people out there who have spent some time in the military but cannot access our services. What does that mean? It means all those community nonprofits have to pick that, that up and help us with that. And so we continually focus on this population um, so that they someday can become eligible. So how does this all fit with research, right? I, don't you like my that thought? Yeah, thank you. So when you think of research in the homeless realm, it's like herding cats. Like, think about it. Like, homeless veterans, how do you, like, do follow-ups with them? You, you may not even know where they live the next day, right? And, and their families. And you've got to track. They don't have phones. Right, so many of them, they don't have transportation, so you can't have them come into your, to your surveys. We have to go find them. It's, it's challenging. Um, the interesting thing is, though, that since 1946, 
There's been over 8,500 research articles that have been published on homelessness. Um, the issue is there's no real crosswalk between the research and actually implementing some of the findings into practice. And folks know this, we, we've struggled with this for years. And over the past 20 years, 300 peer-reviewed articles are published and indexed by PubMed. PubMed's a free search engine, um, accessing primarily the Medline database of references and abstracts on life science and biomedical topics. We use this all the time. Um, folks should know about that. PubMed.gov if you want to find it. So what's really fascinating, right, is since this became a uh, initiative in which we've gotten all of this attention, um, the peak year for articles was 2013 when 500 and one articles were published, so that's good news. The issue for us is, have these observations been put into practice, right? That's the challenge. So there's great opportunities to engage the research community to help us identify uh, pressure points, to help us think uh, critically about some of what's going on, to create an understanding of why things happen. There is absolutely a role for research in the homeless arena for us, especially um, making sure that we just don't write about those observations, but we somehow get them into practice. As I said, there's also challenges to operationalize this. Many times, in, in, uh, for instance, in our case, um, somebody says you've got to end homelessness in five years. And, and you researchers correct me who's out there. Um, I, I read online in several places that it takes about 17 years for research to turn into practice. Have you heard that, Betsy? 17 years. Like, we had five years to end homelessness. Like, we couldn't, like, wait 17 years. Um, a lot of time the data that's been collected doesn't really answer the questions you need it to answer. And of course, dissemination is always an issue. Um, there's this kind of chasm between researchers and operations people, and it's this big gap. So you know what we did? We created our own research center in the VA. Since it was like perfect timing, since we had attention, people knew we had a big job to do. We created what's called the National Center on Homelessness Among Veterans. We gave it three major cores to do research, um, to do education and dissemination, and to do model development. That's sort of our boots on the ground. Uh, we'll, we'll, uh, fly the, we'll build the plane while we're flying it kind of stuff. And uh, what, it, what we mandated it was that we want the National Center uh, to focus on action-oriented recommendations. We do the other epidemiological stuff, but we really wanted us to start to put stuff into practice. So we do six kinds of research, and I'll go quickly through this because uh, Betsy's what I got a little time. Um, population, demographic, and epidemiology stuff. This we have a, a database of 150,000 uh, names of veterans who have entered our system in the VA who have been homeless or had at risk for homeless, and of course we're looking at that for patterns and trends of, that, of those population to see what we need to do different. So right, if you have a lot of older adults entering your system, what does that mean? How do we need to act operationally? We do some predictive analytics. We want to look at um, uh, uh, the likelihood of future outcomes based on uh, the historical data. So we want to look at what do we need to do uh, in, in two or three years. And I'll bring aging up again, because we know that's what's going to happen. Again, we have this bubble of Vietnam vets that are now uh, in their 60s that are hitting uh, and have always been in the homeless programs uh, because of what happened when they came back, when they returned from Vietnam. And they've kind of stayed chronically homeless on and off throughout the years. So now we're at where they're old, right? 66, 67 years old, major medical issues. And we have to change our programs to meet that need. One of the things VA doesn't do is assisted living. Many of those folks are going to need assisted living. So we know this now, so we have time to, to hopefully change our systems um, so that those folks don't die on the streets. Um, we, I talked about doing program or pilot projects. So, right, the field's the best incubator to figure out what you need to do. Uh, we do a lot of uh, pilot projects to uh, 
see what's working in real time and real uh, life circumstances so that we can uh, quickly implement changes that we need to implement. Um, I, and we also do some adjusted related evaluations. Um, one of the biggest predictors of homelessness is a past history of incarceration. And there is a number of veterans who uh, live in prisons right now or are involved in the local justice system. We do a lot of prison outreach and we're looking at evaluating those services to ensure we're doing the right things um, as people start to transition out of prison. We also do things uh, uh, that we share with the Justice Department called uh, treatment courts. So instead of throwing uh, homeless veterans in jail to get them off the streets, um, we work with courts across the United States to get them the treatment they need. And we're looking at evaluating um, those interventions. Of course, implementation research is how do we need to uh, get the system to adopt the things we're finding and intervention studies um, where we're looking at um, doing some intervention controlled studies and trials. And I, I actually have an example um, where you're looking at comparison groups and a higher level of rigor to see if we, we're really making a difference. We have a program called HPAC. It's called Homeless Patient Aligned Care Teams. And what this is is a medical team is wrapped around homeless veterans while they're living in a shelter or out there or in their, they, they could be in their own um, Section 8 voucher, they could be in transitional housing, but we're providing um, medical care social work care, psyche and mental health care, wherever that veteran is. And um, we noticed that um, veterans enrolled in that program used uh, care 30 to 40 percent more than veterans not enrolled in that program, than homeless veterans not enrolled in it. So we want to know, is it the H Pact that makes the difference or is it something else? Turns out, long story short, about um, the, the HPAC makes about 15% of that 40% impact. There's other variables that impact why they use more care, uh, but we know that if you're enrolled in HPAC, you'll, you, you'll get more care, you'll engage in more medical care, and that's important. I mentioned earlier that all of our research has to be operations partnered because it has to translate. We know that there's this gap and we want to translate whatever we find in our research center into our operations so that it becomes real life. And uh, all of our researchers have to work with one of my operations directors in the many programs, outreach, prevention, rapid rehousing, permanent supported housing, so that they can develop those research questions together, uh, plan and the design together, disseminate the results so that it gets out to the field quickly, and uh, help the operations director do uh, policy change as they need. So this is huge. This doesn't happen in so many places. I'm going to skip through these, but you'll have them online. There are three uh, research projects that we've done where we've actually um, taken results to make changes. And I'll also note that in the back of the room, um, we had a uh, special supplemental, uh, um, supplemental, um, what is it called? Uh, like a, a of the uh, Journal of Public Health, yes, a supplemental issue on homelessness in which many of our uh, National Center researchers, researchers are focused uh, in, in articles there. And those are for people to take if they want to take or you can get it online. Um, and um, I'll also point out that we have little uh, dog tags that give our hotline number. So there's a national call center for homeless veterans. So many times um, I have the general public say, what can we do? We saw a homeless veteran. I always say, you know, don't give them money. Get them hooked up with services. There's a call center that you can give the number to the veteran, or better yet, you can call the number yourself while the vet's right there. VA will get an outreach worker hooked up with that veteran and get out to see the vet to see if they'll engage in services with us. So, of course, there's uh, several little tips. If you're going to do research in homelessness, understand your subject matter, what population, hone it down, right? Don't, uh, there's been so much research on single adult males. We need other research done. It just, it just can't be single adult males. What are the circumstances? What's the conceptual model? And uh, uh, know that before you go into it. 
Um, work with your operations partners. That's key for us. That's what's making this huge difference for us so that we can actually operationalize what's being found and get to this 33% decrease. And then, of course, work with the community. Um, you you want to use your community as much as you can and not do your research in a vacuum. Otherwise, you end up with real similar kinds of things, and we don't need more similar. So I want to give you a real life example, that's why I'm speeding through this, where we actually took uh, research to practice. And it's called Housing First. If people heard of Housing First, good, a lot of head shaking. So Housing First doesn't mean housing only, uh, but it does mean that instead of making a veteran, which is, and this is what we used to do, or anybody, go through levels of treatment and care to get the reward of housing, we, we get them in a house first. We have heard time after time from veterans that it's like, how can I think about getting recovered when I don't know where I'm going to sleep? How can I think about like taking my psychiatric meds if I don't know if I'm ever going to get a bottled water or a, or a, a meal? Like, I, you, it's too hard. Don't make me do this. And uh, somewhere um, in New York, a, a guy named Sam Simbaris, um, rolled out this housing first and did research around it and found that it increased outcomes, it decreased ER visits, it uh, decreased uh, hospitalizations, and so um, the United States Interagency Council on Homelessness, which is the White House office that focuses on all homelessness, so chronic youth, family, and, and veteran homelessness, basically said we want federal agencies to um, adopt this. So that helped, right? Um, and uh, start using housing first as our model. So, um, and these are the housing first principles. House, homeless first and foremost is a housing problem and should be treated as such. Housing is a right. Um, people who are homeless should be returned or stabilized to permanent housing and issues that may have contributed to a household's homelessness can be addressed once they're housed, right? So you can look at job and getting stabilized on meds and figuring out your addiction after you have a safe place to live, right? Maslow's theory, I think it's like the second one where you have uh, physiological safety and, and uh, physiological issues taken care of and then your safety issues. So that's what this does. So in 2009, VA adopted it. This was not easy, right? So we went from believing you had to get your substance abuse under control before you could get housing because you couldn't maintain it, or you had to get your mental health issues stabilized because you couldn't maintain yourself living to changing to um, let's get you in a safe place to live and we'll work with you because this is right veteran centric patient driven you tell us what you need and we'll figure out how to help you and if you never want to get clean and sober we're okay with that you don't have to do that we'll always engage you and we'll remind you and we'll educate you but if if you never do it doesn't mean you don't get to live in the house it just means that you might have more struggles and we'll be there to catch you and help you and that's what we did so um, which is huge, and when you have 152 medical centers and 4,000 staff, it's a challenge, right? It does help that the president was saying this and you know all the secretaries, and, uh, but we had to underpin this with all of the research findings. So say, you know, knowing that we're saving tax dollars, uh, taxpayers' money helps, right? If you go to the ER less, healthcare is less expensive. If you go to inpatient hospitalizations less, um, healthcare is less expensive. And uh, we had to reaffirm this in 2013. We had heard that not everybody was buying into it, so we reaffirmed it and we mandated it um, through a memo. And uh, we started doing fidelity, uh, where we actually did site visits to make sure people were trying uh, their best to get to uh, the key philosophies of housing first. Our National Center on Homelessness, of course, um, did this. Uh, they, what they, uh, how we sold it was doing a pilot study um, of 14 sites. Uh, we gathered the information and then translated that for all of our sites uh, so that they could see uh, the actual results and see that it would make a difference. And then we helped them um, by sending site visit teams out there to retool their, their processes. 
So implementing this into practice. So I can tell you it's, it wasn't as linear <laughs> as I just made it sound. It took a lot of educating. I met with Congress regularly, both House and Senate individually. We met with our secretaries regularly. Um, we looked at data. We uh, uh, educated people on it. We met with field staff. We did webinar after webinar, uh, VTEL, uh, conference calls on what this would mean and how to make this happen. We did trips out there. And uh, while we were trying, right, we're building the train, uh, the plane while we're trying to fly it. So it took a lot of educating, communicating, briefing up, down, sideways, making sure everybody understood or at least knew about it, heard about it. Um, we engaged our community advocates. We helped that they helped us sing the song inside and outside the VA because uh, we need our community. And they were saying this was a best practice. Um, we had our community advocates talk to um, our congressional folks. We had them talk to our secretaries. We had them talk to everybody, um, saying this is the right thing to do. Um, and then we measured, right? That's the way you, you really get it going. You help people get there through showing them the results that they were getting. This is huge, but any of you can do this in your programs. You just take it a smaller le uh, uh, level. This was national, right? We had 4,000 staff, 102 medical centers, 800 uh, outpatient clinics where we had to make this happen and get communities to buy in, mayors and city councils and, and Congress and all of that. Um, but you can take that down a scale, but it's the same concepts, right? Get your leadership, get your line staff. Most of all, get your uh, clients involved. Our veterans love this. They love that they don't have to try to get sober while living in a shelter because it doesn't make sense, and they know it and we know it. Um, so we have to look ahead, right? We have to figure out what are we going to do now to maintain the success we have and actually get there in three months. We're going to keep trying. We've already had cities like uh, New Orleans, Houston, Mobile, Al yeah. Alabama all come forward to say we've f functionally ended homelessness. So what, right, isn't that cool? Betsy just gave me a look. Um, where they've actually um, have a name list of everybody homeless in their community and a plan of where they're going to be housed. Because we know people will always experience uh, some kind of housing crisis. The point is that you identify them right away, and then you have a plan within 30 days, 90 days, uh, to get them into a place to live. So those cities have done that. Um, we have several cities on the cusp. I'm hoping Cleveland's one of those cities. I'm looking at Holly, hoping she knows. Um, they only have 200 veterans on any given night here in Cleveland, so it seems like we could make that happen. Um, we also uh, know that in the past we've had great bipartisan support. We want to keep that goodwill. It's really hard to say, no, we're not going to help a homeless veteran. And we've used that to our advantage. You have the same in any of your populations. It's about messaging that. Like, we're, you know, we can't have our nation's heroes living on the streets. That's a, that's a great line that we use that nobody can dispute. Um, so much of the progress that we've made has uh, been because of the research community and the stuff we've been able to do. And uh, it's informed by research. And we know we have to continue the research to continue tweaking it and continue getting the support we've got. Because now it's going to get harder and harder as, we, as our numbers uh, get closer to that uh, zero homelessness. And I just wanted to throw this in, so in case I've inspired anybody to want to get into the homeless arena, the United States Interagency Council on Homelessness has a national research agenda. And uh, uh, they, again, they focus not only on veterans' homelessness, but all homelessness, which include family, youth, and chronic. And they have a list here of bolded points of what still needs to be studied and what still needs research. And of cost effectiveness and cost offsets is huge. No one really studies that. Um, prevalence, homeless prevalence and risk and protective factors, um, improving health, well-being, and stability, accessing mainstream benefits, pathways to employment. All of those are super important, because how, how is important? How is a veteran going to maintain that house if they don't have an income? And now remember my veteran, right? Our vets are uh, uh, compromised. 70% or so have some kind of uh, substance abuse. Um, a, a large number have mental illness. Many of them haven't worked in years. And imagine 
um, what that does for their employment history and actually getting a job. And then when they do get a job, couple that with there's not even enough affordable housing because they're not getting right a, a job that's making 100000 a year, even 50000 a year. So, so all of those areas still need uh, research. And um, we're always looking for folks uh, who are willing to jump into this population. It's not a sexy population, and it's hard work. Um, but it couldn't be more rewarding uh, when I can stand here and say to you, um, this past year, uh, in 2014, we decreased homelessness by 33%, and that's just like a, a phenomenal for us, and it's not what you often hear. So I'm giving you my contact information. We're happy to answer any questions. I have about five minutes, right, for questions? Oh, I'm good. I'm actually, that's my last slide. So we're ready to take questions, and thank you so much for your attention today. I'm standing between them and the um, reception, right? I'll ask a question. Thank you. <laughs> so we are now approaching the end of 2015, and you have some great, compelling figures to share, but it's not reaching the goal. So what do you think is going to happen? So, so this is a good question. HUD's going to come out with, with uh, the, the point in time count that happened in January sometime in the next couple months. I think that um, and communities around the nation have, have uh, done their numbers and their HUD's like in the process of rolling up. I don't think it's going to be the, or what is, how much is 70% that, that we need to end homelessness. That's okay, you know, that's okay. We're not gonna get to zero, it's unlikely, right? Um, but uh, what I will say is that we now know this has got to happen community by community. We did our building of programs and getting resources out and getting the Nash federal agencies staffed up. Now the communities really have to own this issue because only the communities know what their real gaps are. And uh, we're working with communities. In fact, I have um, folks out in 25 major communities, Denver, San Fran, Philadelphia, all, all over, um, helping communities own this issue. Because after our five years is up, right, the attention will likely go somewhere else. And communities have to own this. And that's what I'm hoping to really push, so that even if if uh, and uh, VA homeless programs will be will be around like forever. I mean, they've been around 25 years. They'll stay around, but we won't have the same kind of secretarial and, and presidential uh, likely uh, involvement as as we're going into a new election. Um, and so we want the mayors, which you, is why you saw Mayor Garcetti on there to own this. I, did Cleveland join the mayor's challenge? No, not yet. Not yet. So we need the mayor of Cleveland to join the, the mayor's challenge to get us there. So, so that's what I think is going to happen. We'll still do it. We'll still be around. VA will still be around to help. And it's really helping um, sustain the gains we made and keeping the attention that this is an important population. Hi, uh, Hi. My, my name is Travis Scott. I'm uh, actually placed at the domiciliary. Oh, really? Uh, I used to run that. <laughs> oh, shout out to my Cleveland friends if you're watching online. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, a, a comment and a question. Um, the comment is that uh, in the work that I've done there, you know, we would not have gotten anywhere without Housing First and, uh, and HUD Vash uh, both. I mean, we we lean on them so much to, to get veterans in homes, and it's been very successful. Um, my question is that uh, many of the veterans that I work with, as you said, are sort of uh, chronically homeless uh, Vietnam vets who've been chronically homeless for decades. Um, and I'm wondering, with that lesson in mind, what you see as being necessary in terms of policy to prevent that for uh, OIF, OEF, and OND veterans? Yeah, great question. Uh, you, you know, we're, we're still actually studying this, so we know there's a lot of risk factors that lead to homelessness, incarceration, uh, any kind of childhood trauma history, uh, of course, um, history of unemployment, all of those things kind of are predictors that you, you could fall into homelessness. And so what, what we've been trying to do, and this is one of my staff, Holly Herschel, raise your hand, uh, is, is work a little bit with DOD to get this warm handoff for these new veterans so that they're not out there 
dealing with these issues after they are uh, back from their deployment and then transitioning into civilian life so that we can catch them sooner, right? Now, that's hard because so many of our soldiers are like, I was just a soldier, I'm not gonna be homeless. But if you have all these risk factors and getting a job and translating your military work into civilian work is hard. And so we're looking with DOD D ways to just kind of have a handoff that's not like you're entering a homeless program when you're not even homeless. It's important though, that handoff, it will be mainly important. Thank you. Time for one more question. Shout out to my national folks, too, if they're watching. They'd kill me if I just did Cleveland and not them. So hi, you guys. <laughs> okay. Thank you Great. so much. Well, thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Lisa and Mark, for returning to your alma mater to share your wonderful expertise with us. We are so grateful for that. A uh, special thank you to Betsy Tracy for organizing this really important Centennial Research and Training Colloquia series. And thank you to all of you for coming today, and we hope that you'll return for some of the other sessions. We have a list in the back of different sessions coming up. So thank you for being here, and please enjoy a reception outside these doors. Thank you. <laughs>